to uh, see everything in my screen. I would like to take the questions at the end so we don't uh, interrupt the flow of the um, uh, the, the flow of the uh, lecture. But uh, please put your questions in the chat field as uh, whenever you want, and then I'll see the chat at the end and try to address any questions uh, you may have. If you don't hear me okay or there are any problems, uh, please let me know. This is the first time uh, I'm doing this and um, uh, I have, um, I want to continue doing it because I think the uh, digital transformation of uh, pathology uh, has immense uh, opportunities for all of us. And uh, it's so easy now with uh, digitalization of slides, et cetera, to actually reach every single corner of this planet. Uh, and uh, provide high quality uh, education and connect with uh, colleagues from uh, around the world. So the, um, my lecture is um, uh, named Walking in the Minefield of Soft Tissue Pathology, a kind of catchy title, if I may. Um, and I'm gonna present you, it's gonna be a mix, a hybrid between digital slides and um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. So I'm gonna present a case, uh, show you some relevant immunos if I have, uh, scan them uh, and then um, and then I'm going to present a few uh, basic uh, points about or some new stuff about the the entities I'm going to I'm going to talk about. Uh, I will welcome any feedback uh, you may have at the end or send me an email uh, because as I said this is the first time we do that and I hope it's going to go smoothly. Let's uh, uh, go to the next slide. I have no relevant financial disclosures. So this is the first case, and let's see how that uh, how that goes in terms of uh, with the internet. So we have a kind of a, a excisional um, uh, an excision here who has areas that are look very cellular, look very blue from low power, and then areas that look more hypocellular. Uh, let's say this was about a 55 year old female, and it was uh, in the in, around the sinuses uh, in in the sinuses um, in the head and neck area. And if we go high power here, and I'm gonna go slow so you don't have a lot of lag, although there's gonna be some lag depending on your connection. We show here some respiratory mucosa, uh, which is pretty uh, benign with no significant uh, atypia or any pre-malignant uh, fashions. Let me see, I see some chat here. Uh, if you do. Okay, can everybody, if you don't hear me, please let, please let me know. Some people say you can't hear me, but it's just only one person. And uh, as you see here, there are some hypocellular areas. Let's see. Okay. So you can hear me, I'm, I'm, so I'm gonna continue. I the person who cannot hear me, they maybe have a connection uh, problem. So there are some, some hypocellular areas. Uh, okay, yeah, that's fine. Uh, everybody can hear me, you don't, um, let's continue. So some hypocellular areas, and then there are some hypercellular areas that look very blue. There are some medium sized vessels uh, in between. And I'm just gonna go high power. And obviously you see a spindle cell proliferation. Uh, please mute yourself because I hear, I hear voice in the background. Um, there are some high, hypercellular areas here and it's gonna go high power and looks very spindle uh, with a little bit of eosinophilic cytoplasm or most of it's kind of a background uh, stroma. The cells look kind of uniform and that is a, a, a clue in general. Well, and I'll tell you why I say that, but it looks very, looks very uniform. I don't see a lot of pleomorphism. I don't see areas that I would characterize as high grade areas. And uh, there is a little bit of vesicular chromatin pattern, maybe salt and pepper in some areas, you may say. Uh, increased mitotic activity here and there's some inconspicuous nucleoli, but otherwise it just looks the same uh, all over the place. Uh, but of course, there are, there are areas that they have more collagen stroma here. There's some extravasated red blood cells. And as I said, there were some areas that look more hypercellular here with some um, lymphocytic infiltrate. And of course, if you uh, uh, scrutinize the respiratory mucosa, 
it doesn't show any significant cellulogic atypia or in cytocarcinoma or anything like that. So incessantly, we have a pretty uniform spindle cell proliferation with hyper and hypocellular areas with no high grade areas, but uh, increased mitotic activity and looks quite uh, uniform. So we did a few stains. And uh, one thing that uh, Sharon Weiss, um, my mentor who trained me in bone and soft tissue pathology taught me, you have to go step by step. She was getting, she used to get all these consults and uh, people have done 10, 15, 20 stains. And uh, if you can't figure it out what it is in the first five, five six stains, then probably it's not gonna work out. And uh, you may have to get another opinion or rethink uh, with a fresh uh, mind. So the first thing that we do is to actually uh, define lineage. So we don't just throw 15 stains, but we have to ask specific questions and know the limitations of our immunochemistry uh, very well. So the questions that are being asked after you ask more basic questions, like is it reactive or is it neoplastic, is it benign or is it malignant? The, then the next step is, well, is it a melanocytic proliferation? Is it hematolymphoid? Is it epithelial carcinoma or is it mesenchymal or a sar sarcoma, high grade, low grade, or, or a benign or malignant? And uh, I would say based on the morphology here, uh, I would favor a, I would favor um, a mesenchymal tumor. Uh, I just want to answer for the chat. I'm, I'm recording this lecture and I'm going to upload it in YouTube so you can have access. The, um, this stain here, is Desmin. This tumor was negative for uh, keratin uh, and it was, has some multifocal positivity for Desmin. Uh, there are a lot of cells that there are um, negative here, but there are cells that definitely are positive. I don't think there's any background cells or anything. Either. Clearly there are neoplastic cells as you hear and you see there's just multifocal positivity. Whereas this thing here, is S100, which is quite diffusely positive uh, in, a pretty, uh, in, a, in a pretty convincing way because you have to be careful with S100 sometimes. Sometimes, uh, uh, many times it stains intertumoral uh, dendritic cells and uh, it can look very few, but it can look uh, that there are a lot of cells there and uh, uh, you think they're actually st staining the tumor, the, the tumor cells, but here is clearly, Staining the tumor cells have convincing cytoplasmic and nuclear positivity in a, in a kind of a multifocal to diffuse uh, manner. So yeah, we have a, within the sinuses a tumor that is positive for S100. Desmond was negative for keratin. It actually, was actually negative for uh, SOX10 as well, which is a very sensitive uh, marker, although not exactly specific for a neurocrest uh, origin. So the case that I'm showing you is actually uh, a relatively new entity, very rare, quite rare, uh, called biophenotypic senonasal sarcoma. And uh, when I was training with Sharon Weiss, that entity hadn't been described yet. It actually was described in 2012. It's only 10 years. And uh, in, the, uh, in the old days, what people used to call this most frequently is, I would say, a low-grade malignant peripheral nerve seed tumor because it had some S100 positivity. So that was the problem, problem, the most common diagnosis uh, in the old days. But this is now a specific entity called biophenotypic senonesis sarcoma and biophenotypic for obvious reasons. And what it is, it's basically a low grade senonesis sarcoma who has neural and myogenic differentiation. It primarily affects adults and uh, the female to male ratio is two to one. And you can see it in a different uh, subsites in the senonasal area. The most common is in the superior uh, nasal cavity and the ethmoid sinus. Uh, and then the second most common is followed by the sphenoid uh, sinus. One uh, caveat that actually may uh, throw you under the bus is uh, you can actually see entrapped epithelial elements. Uh, so the differential diagnosis that is raised with that uh, kind of uniform spindle cell proliferation is biphasic synovial sarcoma. Uh, but obviously by a synovia sarcoma will not have uh, that we may have uh, will may have um, some s100 positivity but I don't expect to be uh, that diffuse and strongly positive for s100 and, and and it has of course different genetic background we'll go and talk a little bit um, the other caveat is they can have a stock horn hemangioperisytoma like vessels um, 
So it can resemble a solitary fiber streamer, but obviously solitary fiber streamer is going to be positive for STAT6 and negative for S100. And uh, glomangiopericytoma is another differential, but that is expected to be uh, not to be S100 positive as well. Um, you can see invasion into the bone in about 20% of the cases. And um, just to um, ask to uh, answer to one of these uh, one questions in the chat that they, of course, they can show rhabdomyoblastic differentiation in approximately 10% of cases. And that you can see actually through uh, a bimorphology, you see a really nice right or myoblast or by uh, myogenin or myoD1 uh, expression. Um, So S100 positivity is almost a universal, at least focal. It may not be as strong a diffuse as in our case, but you may at least see focal S100 positivity. And uh, you may see, you will see uh, uh, SMA and calponin as well. Uh, you may, it may be focal, multifocal, uh, usually it's not that diffuse. And of course it has, and it has variable expression for Desmond myogeny. There are cases that are actually completely negative for Desmond uh, as well. Uh, the, the important thing is is negative for SOX10, which is a more sensitive and, and specific, more specific marker for neuroarrest differentiation, uh, and is negative for cytokeratin, which would argue against MPNST. You would expect to show some SOX10 positivity, although MPNSTs they can be SOX10 negative, and if they are SOX10 positive, then they're not they're not in a diffuse manner. If you have something that is diffusely SOX10 positive and looks malignant, then you start thinking about uh, melanoma. Uh, and uh, cyanobia sarcoma will show some multifocal cytokeratin. Uh, Beta-catenin is positive in this tumor, but beta-catenin is not very specific. Beta-catenin, it will be positive, has been reported to be positive in glomangiopericytomas, characteristically. Uh, cyanobia sarcomas can be positive for beta-catenin, and even SFTs can be positive, so I don't use this marker. It's not that uh, helpful. Now, we know a lot about molecular pathogenesis about this tumor, and uh, they have uh, PAX3, for the most part, they have PAX3 rearrangements. And uh, there is there are commercially available fees probes, probes for PAX3. The most common partner is uh, MAM L3, but there are partners that have been reported. FOX01 has been reported, NCOA1, um, unknown par partners. But I think the important thing is you have to know if, if you do just fish for PAX3, there are cases of bionophenotypics and mesocoma that they have MAM. L3 fusions without PAX3. So you may miss this case if you just do fat PAX3 uh, fish. But there are there is a, a, a new a relative new immunochemical stain called PAX3. We'll be all familiar with other uh, PAX, PAX immunochemistry that most commonly you probably have PAX5 in your lab. Uh, PAX7 is a recent one you've been used in Ewing sarcomas. Of course, you know PAX8. So PAX3 in, in, is actually pretty uh, sensitive and specific in the appropriate clinical pathologic context. E everything is in the appropriate morphologic and clinical context. I cannot emphasize that enough, but it's very useful. So if you have you know, a tumor which looks like a spindle cell sarcoma, a low grade, and it's in the sinus area in a, in a, in a middle-aged adult and it's PAX3 positive, I don't, I don't think you need to do molecular. Um, I don't advocate doing molecular in every single case in general, uh, but sometimes you need to do it to confirm, but you don't have to do it in this particular context. The other thing is PAX-8 is actually gonna be positive for in this band of phenotypic cyanonasal sarcoma. Uh, and the PAX-7 actually, we had a case where recently was positive that has never been reported because people have not looked at it. So presumably there is a, there is a cross reactivity there. Uh, but PAX3, uh, it's, it's very useful in, in this context. Uh, no metastasis or regional or distance have been reported so far, to the best of my knowledge, but um, you get high local recurrences, uh, approximately 50%, presumably because the tumor is infiltrative and it's a difficult area to get clear margins. So that is one of the reasons, uh, but people uh, use local excision and then with or without adjuvant radiation, depending on case by case, if you have of course the margins, people will most certainly will get adjuvant radiation. So that was uh, about bionophenotypic cyanonesia sarcoma, a, a, a quite um, rare tumor, but pretty fascinating, relative new one, just to keep in mind. So this tumor was um, a bone tumor, let's say in a 40 year old, uh, in the sacrum, let's say. And um, we got the core biopsies and you see kind of a biophasic uh, proliferation here 
little biphasic pattern. You have the, some kind of spindle cells here. I'm not sure if they're neoplastic or not. You have some multi, some osteoclast here, and then you have something that looks a little bit more hyperchromatic and epithelioid. There are some lymphocytic aggregates. So let's go high part to see what's going on here. So these cells, they look pretty bland to me. They have kind of voluminous eosinophilic cytoplasm with kind of uniform um, nuclei. There's some inconspicuous nucleoli, some nuclear grooves here and some multinucleate cells in between. And then you have um, cells that they have more stroma uh, in between, but I don't see any significant necrosis. There may be a couple of mitotic figures here and there, but I don't see significant pleomorphism. As you see here, let's see a few more areas. There are extravasated red blood cells. There's more spindle areas here, and there's a more epithelioid uh, stuff here. And uh, of course, you know, it's a bone tumor. I start working about carcinoma, some kind of metastatic carcinoma. Uh, all these things would be in the, in the differential. Maybe, maybe it's the, your first uh, thought. But of course, that is a nice area here. You see more epithelioid areas here, and then you see kind of more spindle areas with uh, extravasated red blood cells. So you're going to do your, your, your immuno, so, and uh, you're going to start step by step. You throw a keratin, an S100. Maybe you saw a Desmin, an SMA, and that, uh, let's say, had some positivity for keratin, but was negative for S100, Desmin, and SMA. But one stain that we also did, a few other studies, this is a stain which is very nicely, is nuclear, that is ERG. And ERG, it's not very specific, stains a lot of different things. Well, one of the things that was first come out, first it was discovered you know, in general, ERG fusions were discovered in prostatic adenocarcinomas, uh, but then the main use, at least in the soft tissue world and in, in, in other fields of pathology as well, is actually for vascular difference, for endothelial differentiation because it stains vascular markers. But of course, ERG stains a lot of different things. It stains uh, chondroid tumors, it, it stains uh, AWS R1 SMAD D3 fibroblastic tumor, it stains phosphaturing mesenchymal tumor, it stains myeloid uh, acute leukemias, it stains prostatic adenocarcinoma. I have a whole lecture about ERG, but in the appropriate context, it can be very helpful and we mainly use for endothelial differentiation. But one thing I want to stress out is you never, if you want to prove endothelial differentiation or vascular differentiation, you should never do just one stain. You should do at least two stains. Let's say, I would say CD31 and ERG. That is the stains I prefer because sometimes it can be positive for one, negative for, uh, for the other one. And of course, um, they have the limitations in for specificity. For example, CD31, something you may or may not be familiar, is actually stains, it can stain histiocytes. And in a tumor who has a lot of finder tumoral histiocytes, you may get a lot of brown. Uh, by CD31 and uh, misdiagnose uh, something as uh, angiosarcoma or a vascular tumor where in fact it stains the histiocytes. For CD31, you have to have a very high threshold of what you consider to be a positive stain and should be like strong membranous positivity rather than just uh, granular non-specific cytoplasm positivity. So this actual case was positive for CD31 as well, if I remember well, but Anyway, it is diffusely positive uh, for ERG, and you see here the background non-neoplastic cells are, are, are negative. So this actually, this is tumor. This was this is an epithelial hemangioma, and um, epithelial hemangiomas. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a few things because there are a lot of uh, recent discoveries, exciting discoveries. And one thing about I want to say about epithelial hemangioma in general, you never sign out a bone tumor without correlating with radiology. You you'll never do that. You uh, it is imperative to correlate with radiology and specifically epithelial hemangiomas, they may have something that looks very benign and non-aggressive, but they may actually show aggressive features in radiology, multifocality, break through the cortex. Uh, so the radiologist is really worrying that uh, there is an aggressive uh, malignant lesion here. So 
bear that in mind. And epithelial hemangiomas are being subtypes uh, in the conventional subtype, uh, angio lymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia, cellular subtype. There are some evidence here uh, that show um, that show a lesson about epithelial sarcoma that show um, uh, but that may be dis distinct clinical uh, distinct clinical um, entities. But so far, they are being categorized under one uh, one rubric here: epithelial uh, hemangioma. So they're going to be positive for vascular markers, and one thing is they are going to be positive for D to forty as well. But one pitfall in vascular tumors, and especially when they the more epithelial they get. Uh, they are uh, immunoreactive for uh, EMA and keratins. And they can be focal, multifocal, or even diffuse wall-to-wall -wall keratin positivity. So every time you have something that is diffusely, so it's keratin positive, and even in a diffused manner, just have in your back of your mind, am I missing a, uh, is it possible that am I missing an epithelioid, um, that I'm missing a vascular tumor? And I, I want to ask you one question. Somebody asked me in the chat if that could be an epithelial angiosarcoma. That and that particular tumor actually was proven to be by molecular to have a specific fusion, which is uh, in epithelioid um, uh, hemangiomas. I'm going to talk a little bit later. And I don't, uh, epithelioid angiosarcomas, they look way uglier. This was a bland tumor that it was very uniform without significant pleomorphism, without significant mitotic activity. So that is the pitfall to call an epithelioid hemangioma and epithelial angiosarcoma. And that is a dreadful misdiagnosis with humongous consequences. So I, this is actually the main differential here. Uh, and I explained you a couple of other things in terms of molecular to actually solidify your, your diagnosis. So there are a lot of new things about epithelial um, uh, hemangioma. Uh, there are specific fusions, recurrent rearrangements. Our tumor was proven by NGS to have WWTR1 false B rearrangement. Uh, there are uh, ZFP36 for speed, that is 20% of cellular subtype, and then there are phosphorus rates, and both of them belong to the same family. There are transcription factors, and they have a lot of different partners. The most common in cellular sub subtype, you see phos uh, rearrangement. And uh, the story starts with uh, ZFP36 for speed, which was actually seen in epithelioid hemangiomas with typical features. So there is, the, it seems to be a clinical morphologic and genotypic correlation uh, between fusions, uh, FOSB or FOS, uh, and, uh, and, the, and these uh, characteristics. For example, FOSB fusions are more common in um, <clears throat> skeletal and soft tissue epithelial hemangiomas. And they're so more commonly atypical features, uh, whereas uh, uh, force uh, rearrangements um, are, are more common in, uh, sorry, force rearrangements are more common in skeletal uh, uh, cases where force P are more common in atypical epithelial hemangiomas and, and penile location. So there is some, the, the, there is some correlation there. And um, the thing, and one thing we learn about uh, examining uh, typical cases and you have to be very careful. Our case was easy because I don't think you look that atypical, but epithelial hemangiomas can look really atypical. They can have necrosis, they can have a typical, uh, a lot of mitosis, and you may tend to call this epithelial angiosarcomas. And the interesting thing is there is a propensity for atypical epithelial hemangiomas to be in the penile location, in the penis. So you can imagine if you call a totally benign a typical epithelial hemangioma because epithelial hemangiomas, even with atypical features, they are completely benign. They behave in a benign fashion and called in a, in a benign, a typical epithelial hemangioma in the penis, epithelial angiosarcoma. Well, you're going to get a penectomy uh, in a couple of weeks. And, and, and you, so you can imagine the stakes are high. So you have to be very careful if you see an epithelioid vascular tumor in the penile location, just have in your back of your mind and you, you, you want to call it epithelial angiosarcoma because it's vascular and looks very atypical. Am I, is that possible that I might be missing a totally benign, a typical epithelioid uh, hemangioma? Uh, people have um, uh, studied that even further. So they have frequent FOS gene rearrangements, but these are not so common in the head and neck or 
epithelial, head and neck or skin cases. The head and neck and skin cases, they usually do not have FOSS or FOSS B rearrangements. But anyway, if you don't have molecular, there is a new marker in the market. Uh, this is uh, a FOSS B. Uh, rabbit, that's the most common, is a rabbit monoclonal antibody. There is also a FOSS immunohistochemical marker, which is a polyclonal antibody, which is less commonly used. And of course, it has its limitations, but it work, when it works in the appropriate morphologic context, it's, it's, it's great. So this uh, it's a nice paper from the dermatopathology world uh, that shows this, you're, you're looking for nuclear positivity and this cytoplasmic, you don't take into account the, the cytoplasmic non-specific positivity, but this nuclear positivity, that's why you look and looks very crisp. Uh, and when it works, it's great. Uh, this is another case of a cavernous-like hemangioma, if I may, which basically was a fusy positive for FOSS. So it's a basically a funny epithelioid hemangioma. Uh, and of course, epithelioid hemangiomas, like many other vascular tumors, uh, can be multiple in the skin and can be eruptive and look like ugly and uh, kind of uh, raise alarm to people who are not familiar with these tumors. And this is a nice paper from Europe with multiple eruptive epithelial hemangioma and in their, in their hands, they were all positive for uh, FOS, uh, for FOS B. Uh, and there's some more fit, uh, pictures from the paper. This is an epithelioid hemangioma, kind of a more cellular subtype, which is like a little bit more um, difficult to diagnose, but like nice positivity for, for the marker. So in terms of sensitivity, what we know so far about specifically for the FOS B monoclonal antibodies about 75% in conventional subtype and about 100% in angio lymphoid hypoplasia and about 10% of uh, cellular type. Um, and the, this is a nice paper, a really recent paper from Bone, from a Christina Andonescu Memorial Sloan Kettering, which shows some correlation uh, between FOS rearrangement and FOS B rearrangement. So FOS B rearrangements uh, in Bone, they had uh, um, more uh, typical features and they have a very uh, increased eosinophils for some reason. Uh, and got about half, half of the cases, and I want to be aware of that, how, as I told you, half of the cases in their study with FOS B rearrangements were completely benign epithelial hemangioma that had necrosis. So if you see necrosis, doesn't mean it's angiosarcoma. It can be seen in epithelial hemangiomas. And the ones with FOS rearrangement, uh, they actually had more commonly um, extravasated red blood cells and they had some mixed features of epithelioid cells and spindle cells. So there were, some of them were statistically significant, not all these correlations were statistically significant, but I think the main point here is that it can be spindle, they can be epithelioid, but the most important thing is they can show atypical cytologic features and necrosis and aggressive um, uh, radiologic findings and still be a totally indolent benign epithelial hemangioma. And that is what I want you to keep uh, in mind. Now, I told you that usually the epithelial hemangiomas on the head and neck and skin that do not usually show FOS or FOSB rearrangements and do not stain for FOS or FOSB by immunohistochemistry. So the new data is, and that was expected uh, when, you, when you see these uh, discrepancies is uh, when you see this, that, that they don't stain, they don't have the same fusions, there are two things are happening. Either they are they're completely different tumors and we used to call them epithelial hemangioma where there's something different, or most commonly the, the morphology is so convincing that we know we're dealing with an epithelial hemangioma or an X and Y tumor, but there are probably have different genetic events which may or may affect the same pathways and you get the same final phenotypic result. So the ones that have propensity for uh, head and neck and skin, uh, we now know that they show uh, recurrent uh, GATA6 FOX01 fusions uh, if you ever need to do NGS. So that's kind of a new, uh, the new um, data. So I'm, I'm going to continue with a second, another case here. Let's say that was in a 30-year-old uh, in the ankle down lower leg. A very nice case they sent me from University of Ioanna from Greece. And uh, obviously we, it's a, it's a shape biopsy or an, uh, an excisional, uh, incisional skin biopsy. And um, here we see the startup corneum and the epidermis. And here is the uh, background superficial dermis. And obviously you have a tumor here, which shows kind of a stuck horn pattern over the vessels. 
gonna remind you SFT. It looks pretty hypercellular, kind of uniform, a little bit less cellular here, more blue here. So let's go high power to see what's uh, what's going on. So looks pretty uniform. And if I go power, if I go high power, you you have this intermingle small lymphocytes here, but then we have bigger cells that they look a little bit more epithelioid with kind of more uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm, kind of conspicuous nucleoli, a little bit irregular nuclear membranes, but looks kind of the same all over the place. I don't see any significant pleomorphism. I don't see a typical mitotic figures. I don't see necrosis. Basically, I see a diffuse epithelioid proliferation involving the superficial and deep dermis with a stack horn background, a vascular pattern in the background. I mean, there are a lot of things uh, you think, but you know, your first thing is I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a dermatopathologist and bone and soft tissue pathologist being trained, uh, fellowship trains in both. And uh, the first thing you think about when you see that might, it would be, well, am I dealing with a speech tumor? You know, speech tumors can show these epithelioid uh, features. So you, 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 you so basically you do your basic panel. So you do your S100 or your or SOC stand. I personally prefer SOC stand for, um, for screening because I've seen melanocytic cases, especially the melanomas, that they can lose S100. But I've never seen a melanoma, which is uh, S100 positive, SOC stand negative. I've never seen that in my career. I've seen melanomas with our negative for S100 or SOC stand. But, and I've seen melanomas that they lose S100, but they retain SOX10. I have never, and many people have not seen that, that I've talked about, I've never seen a melanoma, which is S100 positive SOX10 negative. So that's why I prefer SOX10 in um, the last few years. And so you do your keratin, you know, maybe some kind of keratinocytic tumor, you do your SOX10, maybe you do your SMA, Desmond, some kind of a basic panel. But anyway, this was actually a little bit positive for SMA, negative for stocks then negative for keratin. But there's one thing that, one other thing you could be, let's see a little bit more, you know, you, you, know, you, you may argue, well, what look a little bit histiocytoid, I would argue. And I would say that would be a fair, it would be a fair, uh, a fair assessment. And um, one stain is gonna give you the diagnosis and this is ALK. So diffusely, strongly positive for ALK, Let's see the pattern. I'll, I'll tell you why I say the pattern. So the pattern here is basically diffusely cytoplasmic. I don't see nuclear, I don't see basically diffusely cytoplasmic. Maybe you can argue maybe there's a little bit of membranous positivity as well. So diffuse cytoplasmic and membranous. So this is, in this morphologic context, it's a case of epithelial fibrous histocytoma. I want to stress though that Everything is in context in morphology because I told you about spits and uh, it's the, the pathogenesis of spits is through kinase fusions. And there are fusions in NTRAC1, fusions in um, BRAF, fusion in RET, uh, and a lot of different things, including uh, MAP3K8. A lot of kinases are the pathogenesis of spits and also ALK. So spits can be ALK fused and ALK positive, but they have a totally different morphology. They have this kind of plexiform infiltrative pattern, not that epithelioid. And of course, spits will be positive for SOX10, right? So you get that. But what I'm trying to say is that ALK is not specific. Then you have to put everything in context because spits, they're gonna be ALK positive. So epithelial fibrous cytomas in the old days, it had a very unconvincing definition. They say, well, it's a dermatofibroma or benign fibrous histocytoma. Uh, but has more than 50% epithelial cells, which is a not convincing tumor uh, and, um, definition. Uh, it looks, doesn't look, doesn't, didn't, never sounded to me very scientific or data driven. And it wasn't. And, uh, and this is a classic case of epithelial fibrous histiatoma. Usually they have this epidermal colorette. With the, these epithelial tumors, uh, they may see bionucleate forms. They may see accentu accentuation of cells around vasculars. And that is the prototypical. And what we know now about pathogenesis is that the great majority, not 100%, but 90%, 80, 90%, they should actually show ALK rearrangements. And this is a nice study from Boston, about 90% ALK and many other tumors, histocytomas, other 
are potentially in the differential diagnosis were totally negative. And that ALK rearrangement translates to protein overexpression, which is detected by our immunostochemical study. And there also a diffuse positivity for uh, ALK, so it can be very helpful. And uh, if you have a classic case, like the first slide I show you with the epiderma color red and epithelial cells, you know, you may not need to do it. I mean, for, 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 for years, we've been diagnosed epithelial fibrous cytoma without the ALK. Of course, in some cases, we probably were wrong, but it looks classic. I don't think you ever, you need to do it. But what I'm trying to say is that epithelial fibrous cytoma can look weird, can look funny, can have a lot of different patterns, and, uh, and so that can be helpful. So this is so-called uh, chondroblastoma-like, and have, uh, a few reports reported with that kind of term, basically, basically kind of resemble the bone tumor that you see in the epiphysis of young adults, uh, of young uh, uh, people uh, that um, uh, they show this calcification filiate cells, uh, so it resembles kind of a chondroblastoma. Uh, the other thing with epithelial fibrous cytoma is they can actually show uh, predominant spindle or actually totally spindle cell morphology. So that's what happens if you actually, when you define a tumor and you choose terminology that is descriptive. We know in the pathology history that almost all the time, the as we do more studies and we, uh, we study more cases, the phenotypic diversity of the tumor expands. So it's always almost certainly that if you use a descriptive term at the beginning, it's going to be inadequate. That's a ossifying fibromyxoid tumor. You know, it's a descriptive term. And of course, there are cases that are non-ossifying. Just to give you an example that, um, on top of my mind. But of course, and the same thing happened here and, and ha happened all over the place with many different tumors that we give descriptive diagnosis that of course you can have a spindle cell or totally uh, spindle cell. And of course there are uh, ALK positive and they show ALK rearrangements uh, uh, as well. And, um, but ALK is not specific. I just told you there's a Spitz tumor that could be ALK positive. The other thing, in, um, it's very rare, but it can happen. ALK fusions, as we know in the soft tissue world uh, are very characteristic. About 50% of the case are inflammatory myofibrillastic tumors. Uh, which usually, you know, young people in the intra-abdominal, but that can happen anywhere, you know, it's a wide age range, but very rarely, it's very rare, I've seen cases, but it's very rare, they can have actually primary cutaneous inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors, very rare. And this is uh, a nice uh, paper about that. And uh, these cases, they show this uh, spindle cell perforation who has myofibroblastic morphology, very spindly on both edges of the, of the cell with kind of basophilic and in, um, cytoplasm with inconspicuous nucleoli. And there are, of course, ALK diffusely positive, and they're, of course, going to be diffusely positive for SMA in a trump track pattern, like more membranous in contrast to the smooth muscle tumors that they show more uh, cytoplasmic uh, uh, pattern. And uh, that is the uh, respective uh, phase which was positive. But again, ALK is not um, specific, but it's also a couple of new thing. It stains non-neural granular cell tumors. We know about granular cell tumor that are S100, SOX10 uh, uh, positive. They have this kind of uh, Zvanian, there are Zvanian uh, uh, tumors. However, there are tumors that look exactly the same, but they are non-neural. They don't stain for S100 or SOX10, uh, and they show recurrent ALK gene fusions or a, a subset of them. And this is a nice support for, from uh, UCSF, an additional paper here uh, in the cutaneous world. Uh, and there are also not all the great many of the cases that show uh, uh, ALK rearrangements. Uh, and this is positive for ALK. And um, there is a debate, well, is this a different tumor or is it an epithelioid in quotes fibrous cytoma with granular cell changes? Because that can happen in dermatofibromas. This, you know, we, we know for, for, for years, dermatofibroma with granular cell changes. So there's a debate, but I would argue that the fact that they have ALK fusions doesn't necessarily mean that they are the same tumors, right? Because exactly the same fusions, they can actually give totally different tumors. So I don't think the fact that uh, shows ALK rearrangement or even the identical uh, fusion, it's actually the absolute criterion that we're dealing with the same tumor uh, just with granular cell changes. Uh, we'll see. And of ALK 
can actually be positive in Merkel cell carcinoma, even in basal cell carcinoma. So it's not, and not specific for anaplastic uh, lymphoma and all that kind of stuff. And this is a nice paper here for ALK and cutaneous malignancy if you want to uh, read about uh, this specific uh, topic. And uh, one thing before I move this case, I mentioned about the um, reactivity of the ARC immuno, uh, the same with, it, with the same thing with immunofibro with uh, IMTs, it's depending on the fusion part and you may have localization of the fusion protein in different parts of the cell. You may have nuclear positivity, perinuclear cytoplasm, membranous, membranous cytoplasm, et cetera. So there seems to be a correlation between the partners uh, and um, how, uh, where exactly, which subcellular um, place is actually the fusion uh, protein uh, is located. And we've seen that in IMTs and we've seen that uh, in um, uh, epithelial fibrous histiatomas as well. So this was, a, let's say a 25 year old from, actually was from the forehead that I got. Um, and uh, it's, uh, they thought it was a cyst. I think I think went to a dermatopathologist and plastic surgeon or something like that. I got them derm path service. And uh, you have this, uh, you see step cuties here, you have some collagenous areas here, and then you have this kind of proliferation here with a lot of uh, quite blood here. It's in the forehead, you know, the skeletal muscle there is quite superficial. You always get some skeletal muscle, even with the punch biopsy when we do derm path service. So you have a spindle cell proliferation here. It looks quite uniform and you have this kind of multinucleate cells. There is mitotic figures. I didn't see any atypical mitotic figures. Let's say here, again, looks very uniform. I would argue it may it has to my eye a myofibroblastic cytology. This uh, basophilic cytoplasm with inconspicuous nucleoli. I would argue to me, it looks more myofibroblastic. It's, it's very difficult uh, if you're not a soft tissue pathologist, you know, this kind of myofibroblastic look or myofibroblastic feel kind of thing. Uh, you have to see thousands of, ca of cases uh, to get, a, to get a, a good feel of it. Um, but anyway, osteoclast like giant cells in the background, superficial. So, we did some, uh, I didn't do any stains here. I went direct to molecular because I will ha uh, my pretest probability was very high based on morphology, but you could do, of course, you're gonna do some immunos and you know, it's gonna be cured negative. Let's say Desmond, let's say it has some multifocal positivity and it's quite significant for SMA positive, which kind of uh, supports our myofibroblastic um, uh, impression. Uh, and it's negative for S100 or SOX10. So this case is actually a case of nodular fasciitis. This case was actually proved to be USP6 rearranged by FIS. And USP6 has expanded. Uh, uh, the family of USP6 associated neoplasms has actually been expanded the last uh, uh, five years or so. So, you know, initially described in. Um, aneurysma bone cyst, and then nodular fasciitis, but there are all of other entities that probably they belong to the same family. They belong to the same family. It's kind of the same spectrum. I just want to share that with you. So aneurysma bone cyst um, has been described more than 10 years now from Mayo Clinic first paper to show um, USB secret arrangements. They all have different partners. Uh, they all act as a promoter swap. Um, giant cell lesion of small bones, probably the same thing with aneurysm of bone cysts. They also um, USB-6 rearrangement, you, um, nodular fasciitis, myositis fossificans, kind of a relative new thing, fibrosis, pseudotumor of digit, and the cellular, the, the cellular variant of fibroma tendency, at least a subset of these cases, they're actually USB-6 rearranged. And people, some people argue, well, it's probably, there are probably nodular fasciitis to begin with. Um, there are a couple of recent papers about this subject. There are also USB-6 rearrangements and the nodular fasciitis specifically, there, you know, we consider that a, uh, a reactive lesion in the past, but now we have the current rearrangements, but that these lesions can actually regress on their own. So this uh, 
it has this concept of transient neoplasia, a fascinating concept, which is basically what is being applied to for nodes of fasciitis that uh, you know, they expand and then they don't have the capacity to grow further. And then they can, they can, they can actually regress this concept of transient uh, neoplasia, which is pretty fascinating concept uh, uh, biologically uh, speaking. But I wanna stress out that nodular fasciitis when it's classic, it's easy. We used to diagnose nodular fasciitis without stains, without molecular, and I'm pretty sure you have done in your careers as well. But nodular fasciitis can look funny. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure before the molecular, we actually misdiagnosed or didn't recognize funny nodular fasciitis. Uh, uh, so the phenotypic spectrum has expanded. So this is a nice paper that we put. We had uh, three cases that it looked to us, didn't look like classic when we had to do, you know, this, this, this was one case, you see this very dense proliferation of spindle cells, but again, this looks to me myfibroblastic, but it doesn't have any of the classic, it doesn't have this um, extravasated of red blood cells, this kind of um, cyst-like areas, nodular fasciitis, like this breakdown or the tissue-like pattern, whatever that means. I mean, this is like another case. I mean, this looks really non-specific to me uh, or to most people. I, I was suspicious. Uh, so my take is that whenever you have a myofibroblastic proliferation, you can't really put it immediately in a box. Uh, think about uh, nodular fasciitis. Uh, this is, is um, this I would argue resembles a little more kind of more ordinary, but you know, in a in a, in a general germ path is going to be always a reactive stuff. It's a kind of a reactive, non-specific myofibroblastic proliferation due to trauma or something, something else. Uh, and uh, this is the other case we had. Uh, one of my germ path colleagues, kind of non-specific really, it got, got this bump that the dermatologist took out and it looked a little bit uh, fibroblastic, myofibroblastic, fibroblastic here, maybe myofibroblastic. And I, I got hint here when I, this is very focal, and I think this is like early breakdown. You have this extravasated and very early breakdown. That's what that's when I got suspicious that we may be dealing in, in a nodular fasci very nodular fasciitis uh, that it doesn't look like a very very classic one. And it was USB six free range, so we decided to put that in a nice paper. So, uh, moving on to another fascinating case. This was from the elbow. Well, let's say a fifty-five year old uh, patient. And uh, let's go higher. You have here background normal. These are skeletal muscle. And then you have a multi-lobulated proliferation of hyperchromatic cells. Uh, there's some fat necrosis here. So let's go and see what is going on. And you have that proliferation of epithelioid cells. There's some mixture changes or some desmoplastic changes here, some myofibroblasts, myofibroblasts, and it looks, this case looks very epithelioid. I would argue if I put this, this uh, if I put this picture here in a book and I say, this is a case of uh, X or Y carcinoma, I, I don't think I will have any problems um, saying that or somebody doubt that. So it look very epithelioid, but I think, one hint, maybe, it's, you know, it has some vacuoles here, but we argue, well, this is, you know, well, this is solving carcinoma, right? You may argue, looks malignant to me. Um, very prominent nucleoli, vesicular chromatin pattern. There were a lot of mitotic figures, which I can't find right now. And it, it looks pretty malignant. I mean, there's another there's a mitotic figure here, there's a typical one here. And he has this, as I say, this fibroplasia. So we were lucky here, not lucky. I mean, we're, it was easy for us. Uh, we didn't have to put a lot of thought because we knew the history. But if you don't have the history, you may argue, well, you know, this is a soft tissue. What am I dealing here? Am I dealing with a distant metastasis from a carcinoma? That probably would be my first thought. Or, or if you see, oh, no, there's no primary. Well, am I dealing with a humongous sweat clamp? Uh, tumor that has kind of infiltrating down, uh, deeply down in the skeletal muscle. Uh, I would say that's also in the differential. So let's see, and um, let's say you do some stains here and uh, you know, negative for S100, negative for 
uh, Desmond, and then it has keratin positivity. So you turn the positivity, so it's okay, aha, uh -huh. you got keratin positivity, I'm dealing with a carcinoma, and then I'm gonna do my TTF1 and my PAX8 and this and that, they're all gonna be negative. And then you're gonna stack and you say, well, you know, metastatic carcinoma of unknown primary, and uh, you will be wrong. This is the stain is actually ERG, diffusely positive for ERG, and it was actually positive for CD31 as well. So if you remember what I told you, always have in your back of your mind when you're making that, when you see keratin positivity, is that possible that I am missing a, a vascular tumor? This is obviously malignant. So you prove that it was vascular, right? So what are you gonna do? You say, well, it's obviously malignant, looks very epithelioid. Uh, it's an epithelioid angiosarcoma. But I would argue there's something weird for epithelial sarcoma. And one, that thing that is weird is actually this uniformity. And that is a clue. Um, sarcomas are being divided in two categories. They have the translocation associated sarcomas. We are, there, there are about 30% of the cases and you have the um, sarcomas that they have a lot of um, uh, the very unstable uh, uh, genome that uh, look very pleomorphic and that's about 70% of the, of the cases that can differentiate a pleomorphic sarcoma, et cetera. The ones that they have the translocation, there are about 30% of the cases. One clue is that they look very uniform. And the reason for that is that this fusion is adequate in the right environment to give all the hallmarks of cancer and develop a sarcoma. So every single cell has this fusion as the major driver. And if you see that, if you actually see the genome, of these uh, translocation associated sarcomas, it's relatively quiet. You don't see a lot of aberrations with if you actually see the SNP array because that fusion is adequate to give all the hallmarks of cancer, seven to eight, if you actually go back to your basic biology courses and, and give the tumor. When you start seeing more aberrations uh, in uh, trans translocation associated tumor is when they progress, when they get de-differentiated or they kind of progress, then they start changing a little bit of morphology. So that is, I think, one clue here that, well, it looks, looks, damp, looks a lot of very, very, very uniform. And um, this actually is a case of epithelial hemangioma glioma. And we know that because this patient had a diagnosis of malignant or high-risk epithelial hemangioma glioma being diagnosed quite a few years before. And uh, this case was actually WWTR1 come TA1 fused, which is the hallmark of a, a majority of epithelial hemangioma gliomas, and I'm going to talk in the next slides. So a case of malignant epithelial hemangioma glioma, which if you didn't have any story or if it was the primary present, the, pr the pr presentation, uh, and, it and, and it is keratin positive, or it could be keratin positive, you may create significant uh, difficulties, and I think is a fascinating case. Now, epithelial hemangioma, the classic pattern, the ones that look ordinary, that don't look malignant, the low risk, if I say, if I may, they have this vasculocentricity. I would mention here because I'm showing a skin case, especially for the superficial epithelial hemangioma, they are way less common to show vasculocentrism comparing to the deeper counterparts. But they have these epithelial cells in the background, uh, um, um, growing um, in seeds and cords in the background, a mixed soil hyaline background, it may have intracytoplasmic blisters, which basically it is primitive endothelial differentiation. You may actually see uh, red blood cells uh, in the cells as well. So you're not going to see vas good va vascular spaces in the field of hemangioma glioma, good vasoformative areas. If you're seeing that, you may question you're diagnosed about an ordinary epithelial hemangioma glioma. Ordinary epithelial hemangioma gliomas, the classic ones, show primitive endothelial differentiation in terms of uh, um, intracytoplasmic uh, vacuoles. Uh, the, of course, they're going to be positive for uh, vascular markers, I told you, but the cavit is another vascular tumor, and especially this epithelioid, that actually can show keratin positivity in about a quarter of cases. So you imagine the case that I show you, uh, the B keratin positivity, it's, it's like, you have to be very careful. It was very easy to go down the carcinoma route if you didn't have uh, morphology, if you didn't have um, 
history or think about a vascular tumor. Now, the recurrent translocation, the great majority of uh, epithelial hemangiotheliomas is WWTR1, CAMTA1, that has been described many years before. And a subset of them, a lower subset, is so YAP1, TFE3, who looks different than the ordinary hemangioendothelioma. It is uh, more, has well form vaso, uh, vascular spaces. It's very vasoformative with voluminous eosinophilic cytoplasm. It just looks different to the point that people have argued, well, why do we have in the same, in the, under the same umbrella? And I predict, and I'll tell you why, that this is gonna be a distinct entity or different vascular. Why we even call it hemangiotheliomas? Because when actually there are Preliminary data shows that actually behaves way better than your epithelial hemangiotheliomas. I'll show you in a minute. But there are not many cases. Everything's preliminary. For now, it's under the epithelial hemangiotheliomas umbrella, but I predict probably it's going to be separated sooner than later. Now, if you don't have molecular, you know, your NGS and your wherever you are in the world, or uh, you don't want to spend money, it's fine. There is an immuno cam T1, which works very well in the appropriate histo um, clinical and morphologic context. Uh, and um, this is a nice um, uh, study from Boston where you see about 86% of the cases showed positivity. Many of the other epithelial hemangioma, epithelial angiomatoid nodules, a lot of other uh, entities within differential were negative. There was one case of epithelial angiosarcoma, which was positive, but the authors mentioned claim in the paper that uh, they probably were wrong. And retrospectively, this is probably a malignant or high-risk epithelial hemangiotheliomas rather than epithelial angiosarcoma. And that is important to make the distinction. That is probably the most important usage of this stain or the molecular is to differentiate it malignant or slash high-risk epithelial hemangiotheliomas from epithelial angiosarcomas because although epithelial hemangiotheliomas is a malignant tumor, epithelial sarcomas are way more aggressive they, they're, it's a dreadful diagnosis and they have way worse prognosis than malignant epithelial hemangiotheliomas. The CAMTA1 is, works very well. It's, it's uh, nuclear staining and have some non-specific cytoplasm staining in some uh, cases, but it doesn't stain the background non-neoplastic cells and, and, and uh, it works very well. So if you looks pretty good uh, morphologically and you have positive for this stain, you may you don't need to do molecular. You can actually get away with uh, just the, just the, you know. People have looked about the sensitivity and specificity. There was the, this is the Japanese study as well. That they have less cases. They have one case of ductal on the carcinoma. It was focal. You really want to see diffuse positivity to be a surrogate marker for an underlying fusion. Uh, 14 out of 16 cases were positive. I mean, it's not perfect. Nothing's perfect, but a lot of other things were actually uh, were actually negative. But one thing I want to mention, new stuff, um, there are variants of epithelial hemangiotheliomas that have different fusions. They have WWTR1, but they have different partners. And uh, they have MAMEL2, ACTL6A, different um, dry range. But anyway, they don't have CAMTA1 partner. And for so far, there are very few cases they seem to have a propensity for cardiac involvement, but this may not stand the test of time. They may actually... Um, be more cases that they don't show that there are in other locations. But my point why I'm showing this is that actually in these cases, presumably if you do just do the CAMTA1 um, immuno, it's not gonna work, presumably, um, because they don't have this partner. And uh, so that is a caveat you have to be aware that uh, you may still have an epithelial hemangiotheliomas which has different partners. Okay? It's possible in the cases that they just do the immuno, the Boston K, okay, the Boston paper and and, and, and Japan paper they didn't have molecular. It is conceivable that the ones that were negative, they actually had uh, different partners. That's why they were, they were negative. And uh, people have looked at the very recent paper from, from Memorial Sloan Kettering. And uh, it seems like the YAP1 TFE3 behaved way better than the epithelial hemangiotheliomas with the WWTR1 CAMTA1. So that is actually further evidence that may actually be separated as entities. And the other thing is that seems like the solitary soft tissue epithelial hemangiotheliomas, they behave much better than epithelial hemangiotheliomas that they are multiple, they arise from the pleura, or they show uh, local metastasis to lymph nodes or distant metastasis. These are actually worse uh, prognostic factors. 
So moving on to another uh, fascinating case, um, which I had with, um, we had with Dr. Uh, Darcy Kerr, which is my colleague uh, from Dartmouth, uh, Bowden Southeast Division. I believe he's, he's one, of the, uh, he's, uh, one of the participants. Um, and this was a, a tumor in a, in a young adult, so let's say in the epiphys of the knee or um, distal femur. And um, he has a lot of histiocytes. And then he has some kind of a spindle cell proliferation. Let's go higher. There's some uh, woven bone uh, formation here. There are some osteoclast-like giant cells. Uh, cells with kind of a granular cytoplasms, uh, almost certainly uh, histiocytes. And then there's some bland spindle cells with no significant atypia, no significant mitotic activity, no necrosis. There is some uh, collagen background, fibrotic background here. And uh, let's see a few other areas. Um, it look, kind of looks the same. It kind of resemble fibrous histocytoma, right? Let's go a little bit higher again. Fibrous histocytoma-like morphology, kind of these spindle cells. So let's see. So I'm going to show you one stain, which is the stain to go here, and it works worked really, really well. Nice, strong, nuclear, un convincing, unequivocal positivity. All these spindle cells, and actually, if we go this uh, histiocytes, you know, the osteoclast-like giant cells were negative. Let's see a few other areas. This is this was actually the the histiocytes were dead negative, so you have a, a internal control here that doesn't stain when it's supposed not to stain, and it stains a lot of these beautiful cases, beautiful uh, cells. So this is actually a giant cell tumor of bone has this fibrous histiocytoma morphology, which is very well described in the in the literature, and I'm showing you this because this. Uh, immuno can be very helpful when it is. It's not 100%. We know now that, that the molecular drivers for giant cell tumor of bone are mutations in the histone H3.3. The most common is G34W. Uh, from papers vary from 60-65 to up to 90% of the cases, depending on methodology. Uh, but there are G34R and G34V less commonly. And there are all immunochemical stains for these uh, mutations. That's the most common. This is the, uh, the, um, the most common, and this is the immuno that I show you, G34W. Uh, but there is G34R immuno and G34V. Stains very well. It stains the neoplastic cells where the background osteoclast cells are actually negative. Uh, the new thing I want to show you is a paper that my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Kerr, she was a co-author, uh, just to show you there's a new thing that kind of expands the morphologic spectrum of giant cell tumor, which you know can look classic, but then can have a little, little bit different morphologies, like the one I just uh, showed you, is that you, you may have actually really hyaline cartilage. Uh, and that can be a significant pitfall uh, if you get a core biopsy or you're not aware of this, uh, so these are cases of uh, giant cell tumor of bone. Classic case here that show nice abrupt transition to uh, uh, cartilage uh, formation. So this is kind of a relatively uh, new thing that it was published very recently that I want you to be aware of this. Uh, and this is the uh, immuno, the same immuno. You see that the osteoclast like giant cells are totally negative. And the other thing is that you see actually the lacuna, they are positive for this. So this is not a kind of metaplastic phenomenon kind of reactive or some kind of native cartilage, something like that. It's just actually the tumor produces cartilage. So there's some kind of change in the genetic uh, processing there of this tumor and they kind of produce hyaline cartilage. Uh, so this is something I really want you to be aware of because uh, I think it can be a pitfall. And uh, the other thing is you have to be careful. You know, there's denosubum now that we give in giant cell tumors. And uh, when you want to give this uh, drug, the tumor morphology kind of um, 
uh, changes. And we give that because if the tumor is too big and they cannot operate, they want to string it, it doesn't disappear. The uh, neoplastic cells doesn't eradicate them, but the tumor kind of shrinks for reasons that I don't have time to, to explain now. But anyway, it shows a predominant, you may have this uh, significant osseous mark matrix, uh, like here, resembling a different kind of tumor. You may, here is a tumor that shows woven bone kind of uh, in parallel, kind of resembling a low grade osteosarcoma with kind of a cortical lamellar like bone here. Uh, sometimes it can look completely spindle, like in this area. So you have uh, and, and embedded uh, in osteoid or collagenous uh, background here. So you can have a lot of different morphologies. But I think one, one common one is when you get this kind of significant osseous formation, which is kind of uh, throw you under the bus. And if you don't have the history or think of something else, or even call osteosarcoma or something dreadful like that, you have to be aware that gen cell tumors of bone with denosumab, they actually can change significant morphology. Um, and uh, and that correlates what we see in the radiology, right? You see more, more bone when as the tumor shrinks. So the surgeons can go in there and, and, and um, uh, do the surgery more easily. Moving on with another fascinating case that we have. This was a, let's say a nine year old in the thigh. And uh, I'm gonna turn this, it's, it's obviously it's, the, it's, a, it's a skin. Uh, biopsy, which shows this um, unencapsulated, well circumscribed proliferation of cells within the deep uh, and dermis and subcutis with significant hemorrhage and uh, uh, cystic spaces here with, with, with hemorrhage. So let's go and help our to see what is going on. So the tumor, I'll uh, give you a hint. Uh, I have to think the tumor looks very, very uniform, right? So that is a hint that I told you before. I'm not implying anything, but it's something to keep that in mind. The tumor looks very uniform. Um, it looks relatively round, a little bit of eosinophilic cytoplasm. There were a few mitotic figures. Looks quite undifferentiated. I don't know can see a specific lineage here of differentiation just based on morphology. Very uniform, kind of prominent nuclei here. I mean, you may argue if it is malignant or it's not, um, but I would argue that this looks malignant to me. And again, very, very, very uniform. So you do your stains, and you do your panel, your, 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 your screening panel, you do your SOX10 or ESMO100, you do your keratin. Let's say you do your SMA and Desmin, you may add CD34, you may add a NERG. So this actually is, and I would throw you under, we surprise you, this actually is diffusely positive for SOX10, wall to wall. And uh, it's not that you over, we over we overdid the, um, Adjacent retrieval because it doesn't stain when it doesn't supposed to stain. Here's to some eccrine glands, and here in the in the keratin, it just doesn't stain the epidermis. It stains nicely the melanocyte. So, now you see that in a in the superficial aspect. I mean, you, you probably think it's going to be wow. Is this is this a um, is this must be a melanocytic one? And actually, this was actually diffusely positive for for SOX10 as well. And um, but I'm gonna show you one more stain here. And this stain is actually CD99. Now CD99 is non-specific. I don't apply any specificity for CD99. It stains in 99, if not 109 different entities. But in the appropriate morphologic context, it's actually a good screening stain for what this tumor turned out to be. So this CD99 has wall-to-wall -wall strong membranous positivity, every single, almost every single cell. So that is very convincing. So let's move to the next slide. So, and I want to show you, this is the S100 as well. So you see this diffuse positivity for S100. So you have diffuse positivity for SOX10, S100 and wall-to-wall -wall membranous uh, positivity for, for, for the tumor. So this turned out to be a Ewing sarcoma and uh, fascinating case. And uh, Ewing sarcomas very rarely 
and this is this is not the same case. We're actually trying to publish this case because we got it much later, but this is another case that we had and published very rarely. Ewing sarcoma can be S100 and SOX10 positive wall to wall. And that makes sense because they are, they are neural crest tumors. It doesn't happen that often, most commonly they're negative or they're a focal or multifocal, but very rarely there are about five cases reported that can be diffusely positive for S100 and SOX10. Have to be aware of that. And especially when you're dealing with a superficial tumor, you may actually incline to, to, to call that malonocytic tumor. But I would argue, you know, if you want to call that tumor that I showed you malonocytic, of course it's a child, but let's say it was an adult. It looks very, very uniform for a melanoma. Melanoma that big, that deep, will never be that uniform, or never. Melanomas can do anything, but it's extremely unlikely. So when you get that, you start thinking, well, is that possible that I'm missing a different, so you think in along the neural crest uh, pathway. And CD99 is very useful as a screening because 99% is not 100%. I've seen in one case or two, but 99% unisarcoma are wall-to-wall -wall positive for CD99 in a strong membranous pattern. You have to be very strict about your criteria. So if you have a CD99 that is multifocal or focal here or there, the chassis, <coughs> the chances that it's a sarcoma, it's probably very, very, very low. So, but of course, it stains a lot of other things in the differential, right? Uh, it stains a uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, and synovial sarcoma, and lymphoblastic lymphoma, and, and this and that. And uh, so that would be your differential. So the other thing I forgot the tumor I showed you, of course, your differential would be with a lymphoma, right? In a nine-year-old, maybe a lymphoblastic lymphoma or something like that. Your usual round cell uh, differential. So this is the case that we had, we published. Again, it has this uh, uh, necrosis here. It has this pseudo-alveolar pattern that is well described in Ewing. There's nothing new, though it's not that common. Uh, and this case was actually, was also positive for SOX10, S100 uh, and um, CD99. Now you're gonna ask me why this is not a myoepithelial carcinoma. Well, it didn't stain for keratin or EMAR tumor, but the most, the most important thing is the tumor that I showed you was actually molecularly confirmed. It was had AWSR1 fly one, which uh, it's pathognomonic for Ewing in the appropriate context. It has been seen in other tumors as well, but never, never it has never been seen in my epithelial carcinomas. And in this context, it's actually pathognomonic for uh, Ewing sarcoma. So it's not a my epithelial carcinoma, which it's, which is, which if, 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 if you get a myepithelial carcinoma, the chances are it's gonna be in children, but that, that, that case was not. So this is how I wanted to tell you about that very rare possibility that you have a Ewing sarcoma with S100 or SOX10. Another fascinating case here, this was from the axilla from a 35 year old fe female. And of course we've got, a, we've got a biopsy here, have different fragments. And um, let's say what we get, you know, it's obviously a, epithelioid and spindle cell proliferation with uh, coagulative type necrosis. And the cells, they look uh, obviously malignant to me. I can't go higher because it was, uh, it was, it was a uh, scan and 2X. But you know, there's hyperchromasia. They look relatively uniform. You have come kind of irregular nuclear contours. There's coagulative type necrosis. And um, I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure there were quite a few mitosis here. So kind of uh, non-specific, you could argue, well, it looks, you know, kind of the spindle cell and epithelioid sarcomas, undifferentiated from morphology. You can put that in the round cell sarcoma, undifferentiated if you may. So undifferentiated small round cell sarcomas other than Ewing. They have probably similar morphology to Ewing and they likely WSR1 ETS rearrangements. And there's no other signs of a specific line of differentiation. And that case I show you was molecularly proved to be a CIC DAX4 prearranged sarcoma, which is now a separate entity under the new WHO. And the most common are Ewing's. And then apart from Ewing's, there are three categories, the CIC rearranged sarcomas, the sarcomas with B-core genetic alterations and the round cell sarcomas with EWSR1 non-ETS fusions. Uh, the, the largest subset of these non-Ewings are the CIC DAX4. And that was our case. 
and uh, that's to show you, you know, if you have EWS R1 with uh, non-ETS partners, CIC, B Core, and this list keeps expanding and expanding every other week. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about the CIC rare range sarcomas, which was the case I show you. So the, it was described back in 2006, seven, but anyway, the biggest study, the definitive study was done by Dr. Andonescu and Memorial Sloan Kettering colleagues where it started a huge, uh, a huge cohort of 115 cases and that defined that entity. The most common you have CIC DAX4, you, have, you can have the homolog CIC, CIC DAX4 L and it behaves more aggressively than Ewing, has poor clinical outcomes. We'll talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about this. It has a wide age range, is most commonly present in young adults and uh, in, um, in contrast to the B core uh, altered sarcomas, the CIC almost ninety percent arise in soft tissues, uh, split between extremities and pelvis, and there is you can get a minority arising in visceral organs and rarely arising in the bone, where the B core altered sarcomas are more common in the bone. Uh, and of course, in contrast to Ewing sarcoma, which are actually more common, uh, obviously in bone, but of course you can see them um, everywhere. And uh, there are, they have multi-lobulation. They can so this uh, they can have epithelioid, you know, round cell futures and spindle cell futures. Spindle cells can be focal, multifocal. It can be even predominant. Very commonly have this mixed background, and uh, sometimes they get rhabdoid changes. That you have to be aware of that. Uh, and in terms of cytology, they can have a vesicular chromatin pattern with uh, um, significant uh, um, prominent nucleoli or hyperchromasia uh, or cells that uh, even, even have even more prominent nucleoli uh, and uh, larger cells. A few more pictures, they can have kind of a mixed background or kind of a reticular, or can have some fibrotic pa pattern. Of course, you're gonna see necrosis. And uh, what, think, what happens with CIC DAX4, they have more than 100 fold increase of upregulation of WT1 and uh, um, PEA3 uh, transcription factors uh, called ETV1, 4, and 5. That is very characteristic for CIC uh, DAX4 rearranged sarcomas. And I'll tell you why I say that. Because we have immuno. So we have the ETV4 ETV, ETV, ETV immuno and WT1. So that can be very helpful in the appropriate context uh, to actually suggest as a screening method, or even in the, if the morphology looks great, to actually uh, uh, diagnose a CIC rearranged sarcoma uh, by doing ET before and WT1, where you see diffuse positivity. You know, not in all cases where in Ewing, you're not gonna see this diffuse uh, positivity for, uh, for WT1. And people have studied, you know, there's a sensitivity about 90, 95%. There were some uh, non c rare range. Of course, it's not going to be perfect, uh, but it's pretty significant positivity in a great majority of cases that can be helpful, even definitive in the appropriate, if the morphology it is classic. And of course, some people use this, uh, apart from immuno, they have used RNA in situ that's up there. Some people use that, it's not very common. And uh, there is a DAX4, it's not very widely available. It's less well studied, but presumably it's more specific because you actually target the partner. And it had about, in this small study, it had it were only five cases, but it had about 100% sensitivity. And the specificity was 100%. They actually checked about 76 tumors that were around cell sarcomas and other tumors in the differential, they're all dead negative. Um, and you're looking about nuclear positivity. Uh, other tumors in the differential, they have, Cytoplasmic positivity, that was a biphasic synovial sarcoma, but that you, know, you don't take into account. Nuclear positivity. The only thing I'm gonna say about nuclear, about immunostochemistry and transcription factors is that um, you have to have very high standards. What do, you, um, what do you accept as positive? It has to be diffuse, strong positivity because it's very common for immunostochemistry for transcription factors to, to get this uh, weak uh, nuclear positivity and that should be non-specific. Strong diffuse positivity is safe surrogate for the underlying 
transfusion or if you if you use this transcription or in general for transcription factors um, you, because you may use transcription factor even though we don't have an underlying fusion like in this case this case we use it the uh, uh, no this case is actually the uh, DAX4 so the actually um, stay in these cases and actually work very well for pretreatment and uh, post-treatment samples. It work very well, so it's something to keep in mind, but things are never very simple. And even if they sound simple in the beginning, they become more complex because the spectrum of fusions for CIC rearranged sarcomas has expanded. That's why the WHO is not CIC DAX4, it's CIC rearranged sarcoma. For CIC DAX4 and DAX4L is the most common. But less commonly, there's FOXO4 fusion. Otherwise, it looks the same. And uh, same seems that behaves has the same biologic uh, behavior by a different partner. So DAX4 is not going to work. And of course, NAT1 fusion is first described in NAT1 midline carcinomas. Then they drop the midline because they saw another place as well. But of course, there is NAT1 rearranged sarcomas. Uh, which is an emerging entity. We'll see what happened with those, but there is CIC NAT1 sarcoma that um, is, was actually has upregulation of uh, ETV1, 4, and 5 turn, uh, factors, transcription factors, and it stains nicely and behaves otherwise the same so far from the few cases that we have with the other CIC sarcomas. And there is more stuff. There's NAT M2. So there's a lot of different partners. That's my, my point. Uh, uh, so you have to be aware that all belong to the same entity. There's a beautiful paper from, uh, from France and other colleagues uh, that saw the transcriptional definition of molecular subgroups of small round cell sarcomas. And you see here the CIC DAX4 and CIC DAT1, they're just all, they were different from Ewing sarcoma and other uh, tumors. They were just in, the, in, their, no, in, their, in their own uh, corner there. So the further evidence that they actually are a distinct entity. And uh, this certainly is going to expand. This uh, CIC EFT has not been seen in soft tissue world yet, but has been seen in CNS. CIC rearranged uh, has been seen in, uh, in brain tumors and uh, almost certainly at some point it may be seen in soft tissue. Just to show you how the expansion, but they're always CIC rearranged. So that's how the WHO is CIC rearrangement. But things are not Again, simple DAX4 that I told you can do the immuno. One of the differentials, you know, in an undifferentiated round cell sarcoma would be, of course, lymphoblastic lymphoma, right? So you, you want to do immunos that define lineage and DAX4 and ETV4, or WT1, all, all that kind of stuff. I told you they're not defining lineage. And so if you just do DAX4 and say, so, okay, yeah, it's a CIC DAX4, I'm done. No, because DAX4 rearranges acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It's well described in the literature, so it's presumably it's going to be positive. I haven't checked it, but I will not be surprised. So first, small panel lineage, and then, and then you go step by step. And, uh, and if you're not in the leukemia, but you are in the, you are in the uh, soft tissue role, again, things are not simple because AWS R1 with DAX4 has been seen in cases in case of embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, which makes things even more uh, complicated. So, I mean, if you do NGS, this all will be presumably um, solved, but of course, many of you may not have access, easy access to NGS. So I'm just giving you all the pitfalls here. That's why uh, the, I decided to, the, the, the name of my talk was walking the minefield of soft pathology, because I'm, I'm pretty sure you've already realized that they're all mines everywhere. Um, and the other thing is CIC DAX4 actually demonstrate mean, mean amplification and ETS family transcription factor expression, <laughs> which is very important because as I'll show you in the next slides, CIC rearrange, CIC changes, either rearrangements or mutations, they're not exclusively seen in CIC rearranged sarcomas in that category. They actually have been seen in angiosarcomas. And of course, radiation induced angiosarcomas, the molecular signature is mean amplification. So things may get there complicated. So you have to be aware that not angiosarcomas, but CIC DAX sarcomas, or uh, actually can show mean amplification as, and actually can show ETS family transcription factor expression, which is ERG and FLY1, right? So another tumor that can show ERG expression is actually a CIC DAX rearranged sarcoma, which drops the specificity of the ERK, but um, it's something to be aware. But I think 
the, the, the pitfall here is ERG as a vascular marker, meek amplification, let's say, was radiation, and then you get an angiosarcoma that has CIC rearrangement, and then you call it angiosarcoma when actually it's, it's not. Other immunos have focal expression for Desmin, S100, MAC4, et cetera. Keratins can be coloretinous. One thing is NKX22 that people use for Ewing, pretty good stain for Ewing. It's actually negative. So I, I think it's good screening. No, if you do, uh, as I said, it before expressing nuclear, of course, it's not going to be 100%, right? And the other thing, it before you want to see diffuse strong positivity. You know, focal staining has been seen 10% of Ewing sarcomas has been seen occasionally in desmoplastic, small round salt tumor, rhabdol, melanoma, and uh, WT1, it's actually positive, as I told you. We have to be careful. Um, we usually use N-terminus. The C-terminus, you know, classically, we, we, we teach that it's positive in desmoplastic, small round salt tumor, but it has been reported in CIC range sarcoma. So it can be positive for N or the C-terminus. So that's another, another pitfall there. But of course, they're going to be WSR1, WT1 rearranged. Um, DAX4 is quite sensitive, but it's not very widely available and it's not well studied uh, in this uh, case. But I think you can apply, if you have something that looks classic and it's diffusely strongly positive for ETV4 and WT1 and negative 4 NKX 2.2, uh, that's a good panel to uh, uh, actually make the diagnosis even without molecular. Uh, and if you do molecular, one thing you should know is that uh, CIC fish is not that sensitive. Well, 15% of cases that actually can be negative because, uh, because of cryptic rearrangements. So you may actually miss them. So if you get a fish negative for CIC, it doesn't mean it's not a uh, rearranged uh, sarcoma. So, right? And um, these are the survival data from this big study from Christina Andonescu shows actually it's different from Ewing, behaves more aggressively, disseminates faster. It doesn't respond well, very well to Ewing protocol, although that's why we give because that's that's what we have. And um, it's something to keep in mind. But the other thing to keep in mind is CIC gene abromalis and angiosarcomas, either through rearrangements or fusions. So, and that is very interesting because there is a disconnect uh, between pheno phenotype and molecular signature because this CIC, um, uh, these angiosarcomas with CIC gene abnormalities, they actually show upregulation of ETV1, 4, and 5 factors, which is the same genetic signature with the CIC rearranged sarcomas. But they stain, they are phenotypically angiosarcomas. They stain for uh, not just ERG, because I told you ERG can be positive with CIC rearranged sarcoma, but they stain for CD31 and CD34, etc. So how do you treat these cases? Do you treat them? Do you treat the phenotype? Do you treat them like angiosarcomas with EVG, VEGF4 and other um, uh, drugs, or you treat them? You treat the molecular signature, so you treat them like a CIC rearranged sarcoma, which you use in Ewing-like protocol. And uh, so far, if you get these patients and you get them to so-called basket trials, they are going to treat the uh, molecular signature, so they are going to treat it as Ewing. Uh, so they don't really care about the phenotype. So, so this is interesting. We'll, we'll see. Well, I don't know what is the right. Nobody knows what the right answer. These are rare tumors. We don't have very effective treatments. But it's interesting when there's a discorrelation between phenotype and genetic signature. What, how these tumors events are going to be treated? And uh, I just want to show that because uh, we published that. It was a case from uh, from from Northwest Greece University of Ioannina. They're they're here with us today. That CIC rearranged sarcoma. Actually, actually, people say it's actually more common than superficial Ewing. It can be seen in, um, uh, in skin. And that was three cases that we had from uh, different parts. Uh, that was the case that we got from Greece. I got from Greece, um, kind of deceptive, very well circumscribed, kind of mixoid. Uh, and it was actually CIC rearranged. That was the fist. This time the fist was positive. It was a dual fist, was positive. Uh, Christina Donescu MSK did that for me. And then, and this is the largest series of uh, CIC in a superficial aspect. Uh, so it can happen in the skin as well. It's just something to be aware of. So take home points, a typical morphologic findings are common. If you get a, a, a CIC sarcoma in bone, it's probably correspond to a secondary site. Bone primary is exceptional, it can happen, but you have to look for a primary. 
you have to be careful that I can show WGT1 positive for the C terminus as well as the N. So be careful there. Uh, and uh, a subset of EWSR1, ETS or non-ETS, which are different tumors, they actually can display ATP and high grade features as well. So sometimes if it's classic, you can do the immunos I told you, but sometimes there's just, there's just no way you you got to um, uh, uh, do NGS uh, if you can, or send it somewhere else. Um, caveats, pitfalls, mines, calretinin and cytokeratin can be occasionally seen. So you the difference if you get an intra-abdominal case, it can be a carcinoma or mesothelioma. And of course, ERG and FLY1 are not very specific. They are, we saw that they're positive in CAC sarcomas that they would not differentiate from Ewing sarcoma at all. And um, a couple of differentials here, your extraskeletal mixer chondrosarcoma and my epithelial tumor will be your differential extraskeletal mixer, uh, mixer chondrosarcoma will be uh, NR4A3 fusion fused. Um, my epithelial tumor will um, show AWSR1 rate range of significant percentage of cases. They're gonna be more S100 positivity or SOX10 positive and EMA or low molecular weight keratins. Of course, keratins can be seen in CAC sarcomas. Uh, sclerosing epithelial sarcoma, that's another differential. I think MAC4 is a very useful stain. Sclerosing epithelial sarcomas are gonna be EWSR1 or FAS fusion, but there are an expansion of fusions now in this entity that we're gonna see YAP1, KM, uh, KMTA2, PAX5, uh, PRXX1, I think. Um, so a lot of different fusions rather than your classic EWSR1, F, F, FUS and CREB uh, uh, L, CREB3, L1 and L2, et cetera. Uh, but I think MAC4 is good. You want to see diffuse strong positivity. You may see MAC4 positivity in CIC right range sarcoma, but to see diffuse strong positivity is extremely unlikely. But uh, because it isn't differential, you may have actually a CIC right range sarcoma is described mimicking a sclerosing epithelial sarcoma, right? So keep that, keep that in mind. And of course, you have CIC right range sarcoma with epithelial features. And I told you that CIC right range sarcoma can be ERG positive. So that you may call and another pitfall that you may call uh, epithelial angiosarcoma, where in fact you're dealing with a CIC rearranged range sarcoma with epithelial features. The truth is that if you put enough sections, you're probably gonna see more classic or non-epithelial features. But if you get a core biopsy, you have a small sample, that is another mine in, in our minefield that you may actually uh, hit and explode. And uh, this new thing that still it's um, uh, 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 an ending making, uh, SMART4 deficient thoracic sarcoma, carcinoma. Some people think they're all carcinomas. Some people think some are carcinomas. Some people think there are some chromas. Anyway, SMART4 deficient uh, tumors, malignant tumors are actually are within the differential uh, as well. They're gonna be diffusely positive for CD34 uh, for the most part. Uh, another tumor I was uh, on the on the finger of a young individual. You see here you have we have some um, I think there are recurrent glands here, and you have this uh, spindle cell proliferation gland. There are collagenous areas. There are kind of a little bit hypercellular, more mixoid areas. So let's say let's go high power to see what's going on. So we have a very kind of hypocellular spindle to stellate proliferation of cells in a in a collagenous background. So I, I would say it looks benign to me, it looks very hypocellular. I don't see mitotic activity, atypia, necrosis, etc. So you could argue, well, you know, the difference would be where well, it could be a fibroblastic tumor. Uh, the other thing you could think, are we dealing with uh, some kind of, um, are we dealing with a, a neurofib um, with a neural tumor, I guess could be, though I don't find this cytology convincing for neural uh, or um, for Zvanian, uh, but it could be a perineurioma. I would say that is a new differential. So let's see what we did. So this tumor was actually negative for keratin and negative for desmin and S100, et cetera, but this was diffusely positive for CD34 or significantly positive for CD34. 
you see here. Nicely positive. And the, the new and the new stain for this ND, relatively new that I want to show you, which is very helpful, although you don't necessarily need it in this context, it's actually uh, RB1. RB1 has nice internal positive control, but if you actually see the neoplastic cells are dead negative. And we're going to talk a little bit about RB1 uh, in, uh, in terms of this tumor. So loss of nuclear expression with nice internal positive control, RB1. So this is a case of acral fibromyxoma. We published that the new thing is that it's another entity within the RB family which shows RB1 loss. RB1 is not specific. Uh, it is a tumor suppressor gene which is mutated in about 20, maybe 20% 20 of human neoplasia. It's nothing specific, but in, in the appropriate morphologic context, it's actually very helpful because RB1, this is another case we had in the paper. This is actually another case of acrofibromyxoma. It looks very similar. Acrofibromyxoma can be actually, usually they show this uh, transition between collagenous and mixoid areas, uh, sometimes can be predominant uh, collagenous, sometimes can be uh, predominant mixoid. They can actually even invade the bone in your finger. So that doesn't, shouldn't uh, uh, make you, um, it's fine to make the diagnosis. Uh, that is the case that we had diffusive positive for CD34, uh, negative for keratin and S100, but you see here an RB1 completely negative in the neoplastic cells with nice internal positive control. Uh, so that's why I want to tell you RB1. So RB1 belongs to the family. Uh, in terms of the mesenchymal world, their you, their 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 loss of RB1 is helpful in spindle cell lipoma, a pleomorphic lipoma, a typical spindle cell lipomatous tumor, a typical pleomorphic lipomatous tumor, cellular angiofibroma, and mammary type myofibroblastoma. This is all the RB1 family that it can be helpful uh, if you see loss, uh, which is a little bit more specific in this morphologic context comparing to your archaic CD34 stain. So acral fibromyxoma, it's another addition to the benign mesenchymal entities that can show loss of RB1. Moving on to the next case. This was, uh, let's say it's from the knee from a 40, from a 33 year old male, which shows again, core biopsy with not very specific uh, spindle cell proliferation. It looks quite uniform to me. The cells, they don't look at all pleomorphic. I don't see a lot of mitosis. I don't see epithelioid areas. Let's see, there's a little bit of extravasated rails, but this just, it just looks all over the same, looks very uniform. I don't see any glands. Uh, there is a little bit of collagenous background, <coughs> kind of squeezed in between the cells, but otherwise looks very uniform. It's another clue, yet you may be dealing with a translocation associated tumor, some skeletal muscle here. And of course, you're going to uh, start doing your markers from your differential here. I mean, it will be, of course, uh, it could be an MPNST, a synovial sarcoma, a rhabdomyosarcoma. I guess that, that things that I would think about it. But um, so you do your panel, you do your keratin, your desmin, um, SOX10, SMA. It has some multifocal positivity for keratin. And let's see here, I think this case had, but it can be completely negative. I think this case did not have keratin, which is not. Uh, which is okay for the diagnosis that this was, and I tell you, but this was dead negative for keratin. So and one thing it was positive, diffusely positive, and I want to say a couple of words about that. It was diffuse positive for TLE1, which as you know, uh, it's good for synovial sarcoma, but TLE1, you don't use it for its positive predictive value. TLE1 is not specific stain. TLE1 stains because a lot of different things, even in diffuse manner. So of course, here it's helpful because my pretest probability is actually pretty was actually pretty high that I may be dealing with a synovial sarcoma. But uh, the helpfulness about TLE1 it's it's negativity. If it's if it's negative, 
the chances that are uh, that it is a synovial sarcoma are very, very low. Uh, so this was a molecularly confirmed synovial sarcoma, but why I'm, I'm showing you this case because I wanna show you something new, that's a, a new paradigm in immunohistochemical markers. Now there are, um, there are um, immunohistochemical markers produced at the target, there are, there are actually antibodies against the specific fusion protein. I show you immunohistochemical markers that they were staining transcription factors, that they were upregulated from the from the rearrangement because of the rearrangements, or I show you like the CAMTA1 and the FOS immunohistochemical markers that they were that they were for one partner, but now they are being uh, immunohistochemical markers being produced that they are targeting the fusion protein, and there are two that they work very well to the point that if you you don't need to do molecular. It is the SS18, SSX, and SSXC terminus. So the SS18, SX is very specific. It's almost 100% specific. So I saw you a flow chart. So if you have this case in the appropriate clinical morphologic context, right? If you have this positive, you don't, you're done. You don't need to do anything. The specificity so far is 100%. The sensitivity is about, I don't know, 85 to 90%. The SSXC is almost, it's almost, some people say 100% sensitive, but it's not that specific. So if that is, if that is negative and that is positive, then you may actually be dealing still for a synovial sarcoma and you may actually pursue that route. If both are negative, then you're not dealing with a synovial sarcoma. So this is what people have suggested. If SS18, SSX, or 100% sensitivity, less sensitivity, specificity, a little bit less sensitive, it's positive, you're done. If it's negative, but the, the SS, SSXCT is positive, then you may proceed for FIS because it's, it still could be well be a synovial sarcoma. If it's FIS is positive, you're done. If it's negative, it's excluded. If both are negative, you're most likely done. It's still, I mean, nothing is perfect. And this is a new stain. If still is very, very, very possible, you think it's possible, then you go to FIS. If you don't think it's possible and they're both negative, you're done. So it's actually, I think these two stains in the great majority of the cases, they're going to drop the need for molecular confirmation. Uh, and that's probably what's going to happen. And that's a couple of pictures from, from, from the paper here. And different case that we have, there was the intra-abdominal mass uh, in a 60-year-old around the pancreas. And this is the case that we got. It was within a leaf node. This is the remnants of leaf node. Uh, very hemorrhagic and a very hypercellular tumor here. So let's go higher power to see what's going on. It looks kind of a uniform tumor, has this kind of uh, short fascicular or the whirling uh, growth pattern and then very characteristically has these intermin intermingle lymphocytes in between. But otherwise very uniform. Inconspicuous nucleoli, a little bit more multiple nucleoli, not significant pleomorphism, not significant uh, cytologic atypia, at least in terms of pleomorphism, but this spring of lymphocytes is very characteristic and it's kind of a whirling pattern. So this case, there are so you two case, two stains. This is diffuse positive for CD35 and diffuse positive for CD21. So I gave you the, di the diagnosis. The answer, this is a nice case of follicular dendritic cell sarcoma, which is characteristically in the classic cases like this one shows a sprinkle of lymphocytes. And this is CD35 and CD3021, which are follicular dendritic cell markers. The same here. The unusual thing uh, with this tumor, and I want to stress this, uh, Desmin has been um, described about 10% of follicular dendritic cell sarcomas, and I think I'd be a pitfall. In our hands, it was quite diffusely positive. Now, you may argue me this could be due to pre-analytical or analytical factors, like a lab. I mean, it's, it's plausible, but the fact is that Desmin has been described in follicular dendritic cell sarcomas. So I would consider this as another mine in the soft tissue minefield that we can uh, distract this, uh, derail you from making the correct uh, diagnosis. 
uh, for molecular detergent. So we published this case because why, why we published this case? I'll tell you because we did molecular and this is nice uh, for, for you for use cytology. It was beautiful cytology pictures that we have that I'm not gonna pretend that I know. But this actually was a tumor that shows uh, mutations that were novel. And usually um, follicular detrinity cell sarcoma shows uh, dysregulation of the uh, NF NFKB pathway. Uh, but this actually had novel uh, TRAF3 mutation, which was, uh, dis was disrupting the NKFKB pathway uh, in the non-canonical way, not just the canonical way. So that was pretty novel. So in general, so follicular detrinity cell sarcomas look quite beautiful. They don't have fusions, but they have this regulation of NFKB. And the other thing you should know, it may be potentially uh, useful uh, from a therapy point of view, is they show BRAF mutations. So they can actually show BRAF mutations, something that you have to be aware of. It. And I'll show you a couple of three cases now more uh, quickly. This actually was a paratesticular mass, if I remember well, in a 25 year old. And um, it looks pretty well circumscribed, and, uh, but unencapsulated. Has some fibrin stuff here, but then he has these vessels that they were, have this kind of a hobnail morphology with, um, eosinophilic globules, pretty bland and uh, anastomosing, I would say, here. And um, no significant atypia. This was well circumscribed, but it can show some infiltration as well. This particular tumor, uh, background of uh, muscle here, smooth muscle here, again, vascular space or spaces with this hobnail uh, cells that are endothelial with uh, red blood cells in between uh, inside the, um, So this is actually a beautiful case of anastomosing hemangioma, was actually first uh, described in the kidney by Dr. Elizabeth Montgomery, I think. Uh, in the kidney, I think it was the first, and it actually can actually be misdiagnosed as angiosarcoma because it can be a little bit infiltrative, it can have this anastomosing pattern. Uh, it has been described in liver, and by, more, very commonly in the spine. So I wanted to show you because it was a beautiful example. The new thing about anastomosis and hemangiomas, they actually show uh, GNA mutations, GNA11, GNAQ, GNA14. That's a new and a very a different vascular tumors, benign or non-benign, that actually have seen, shown uh, GNA mutations. We are familiar in derm path with GNA mutations because uveal melanomas, Blue nevi, blue nevus like melanoma, um, uh, leptomeningeal melanocytosis, they're also GNA mutations. But recently, a lot of different uh, vascular tumors, benign for the most part, but there are some hemangiotheliomas. I think there was one case of caposiform hemangiotheliomas that they show mutations in the GNA uh, family, something we're aware. And I saw two cases quickly because they're just beautiful examples. He was a, a young female on the femur, a, uh, a bone. You have this kind of cortical bone, and then you have this kind of um, trabecular of bone. Some of them are bigger, some are less bigger. They kind of uh, intermingle with uh, some areas in between. who looks more osseous. Then you don't have this fascicular growth pattern, or kind of this lamellar, like um, um, trabecular. Uh, like trabecular in parallel, they look, they look very um, bland, kind of a short fascicle. So this is, I just want to show you, I really like that case because usually you diagnose that in a core biopsy and you never, you don't get the excision. This is a, it's a fiber osseous lesion and it's a beautiful case of fibrous dysplasia. This was the monoostotic uh, lesion, of course, fibrous dysplasia can be seen in, young, in younger adults, in, in a polyostotic form, you have uh, macunal bright syndrome, you have skin abnormalities, endocrine abnormalities, or can be seen within the setting of Maza Braut syndrome. You may get, if we get cardiac myxoma, put these patients at risk for uh, sudden death. Uh, so that's a beautiful case. I think even Lopar is even more a beautiful case of uh, fibrous dysplasia. And the last case I'm going to show you this was a um, thigh mass in a 50 year old. We didn't have very aggressive features radiologically, 
but I want to show you in, in looks very mixoid. You have some vessels in between. The cells looks bland, kind of spindle with kind of, uh, sometimes you may argue they have bipolar cytoplasmic processes. So I would say your difference here is, am I dealing, could, that, could this be a very mixoid perineuroma? Could this be some kind of neural tumor, although that cytology doesn't look neural to me, like it's Vanian tumor, I mean, uh, um, or am I dealing with an intramuscular myxoma? Or am I dealing with a mixed fibrosarcoma, which just happened to, to hit uh, the area that looks very hypocellular and uh, resembling and benign thing? Of course, here, correlation with radiologic studies, it's, it's critical. And uh, this is a case of cellular intramuscular myxoma. And I'm showing this case to show you that they can look a little bit cellular. That, so it's fine. Uh, that the vasculature is not that of uh, mixer fiber sarcoma and usually mixer fiber sarcoma, you would expect to see a little bit more atypia <clears throat> and you have more aggressive features radiologically, kind of very infiltrative radiologically. So intramuscular myxomas can look like totally mixed with a few cells and that's the easy one, but cellular intramuscular myxomas for those who don't do soft tissue pathology, it may actually be problematic. So this show you this to show you that they can they can look that cellular it, it's fine uh, as long as everything else fits uh, so it's, it's it's a case of cellular uh, myxoma so these are my uh, contact details email twitter i want to mention one thing here is that we have established an international health fund so we in dartmouth my uh, myself uh, dr kerr uh, we actually do consults from internationally for free. Um, we are, uh, please do not hesitate if you have a difficult case and you want, want a second opinion, do not hesitate to send us uh, the cases. Uh, we'll do everything for free. We'll, we'll issue a report, we'll return the material back to you. And of course, if you want to collaborate with any research projects or you have any incredible ideas that we haven't thought about it, we're, we're open, please contact me uh, send us the cases uh, or, or, or do research. We, we are very, very open. And, and this is the, the end of my talk. And I'm going to see the chat now and see if I can answer um, any questions. So let me uh, see what questions there are. So the answer, if I would be possible to record the presentation, the, the presentation has been recorded. I'll try to uh, uploaded the uh, IR answer if, if the biophenotypic phenonisa sarcoma can be myogen and myod1 positive can be but it's not necessary it's not it's not positive in the, in the significant percent of cases in the majority of cases actually it's not but yes it can be positive but if they're not positive it's fine if they're not as 100 positive it's fine uh, but then you have to do further studies to confirm the diagnosis if the epithelial hemangioma can be epithelial angiosarcoma I think I answered this question I uh, hope adequately Factor 13A, uh, I, was, I never use the stain, uh, I, and I, I encourage you not to use it. It's not useful at all. I, I have not used this. I mean, people use it for dermatofibromas. I'm not sure if that, that question uh, belongs to, uh, to the epithelial fibrous histoma, uh, but I, I suggest to, to not use the stain. It's not helpful. So which all antibody we use the D5F3, the same as lung tumors. That's the most sensitive. It's more sensitive than the ALK1. We have both, but I had cases where it was ALK1 negative, but DF5F3 positive. So I suggest and to use more sensitive clones and D5F3 is uh, one, um, one of these. And yes, it's the same antibody with lung tumors. I'm not sure the angiomatoid fibrous histoma. Uh, I guess you may be referring to the epithelial to the Ewing, a lot to the Ewing sarcoma. Yes, I do think that's a risible differential if that's what you're referring to, uh, but uh, obviously it was not for the reasons and un mentioned. Uh, yes, the Ewing sarcoma was confirmed molecularly with the WSR1 uh, fly one, and AFH will not be expect to be diffused as 100 or sextant positive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you may see a little bit of S100 here or there, but the few strong positivity would not be, is not, you're not going to see that in AFH. 
I did not do GNS mutation. Uh, we don't because you know it's expensive tests, and this uh, tumor looks so classic to me uh, that uh, it's not necessary to do it. But of course, you you could do it. It's not 100% specific. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, it's not 100% sensitive. So even let's say you do it, you have to ask yourself, what am I going to do with if I get a negative result? If you if you if you answer, if your pretest probability, which is the morphology, which is the most important data, the most important data you have is morphology. If your pretest probability is so high that a test, any test, is not it's not going to change what you call it, negative or positive, then you don't do the test. So you have to answer or say, if I get a negative test, will I change my mind? If your answer is, I don't care what the test says because that's what it is, uh, then you don't do it because uh, there's, there's no point to do it. Um, let's see, um, I'll, I'll put the uh, lecture in YouTube and I'll send you an email uh, or follow me on Twitter and uh, you'll be able to, uh, to access that, that lecture. And um, I don't see any questions. Let me answer my, um, my screen. I'm stop sharing. And um, I see a lot of people still, that's uh, encouraging.